Okay. Eugenia. Puedes hablar. Can you say something? No. It works. No. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, yes, I heard you. I think Hi. I heard you. Hi, Lorenzo. How are Hello. you? Hi. Hi. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Vicenza. I'm from Vicenza, but I live in Den Haag. Den Haag. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, The Hague, and we have uh, Pennsylvania and Bucharest, and Mexico. Where are you from in Mexico, Eugenia? Okay, I think you're be writing something. I can't see anything. I can't hear anything. Oh, for Mexico City, okay. Did it reach 20 million people yet, Mexico City? Last time I was there, it was like 12 million. And, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, we're a little bit from all over the world. And I suggest at this point uh, we can uh, start uh, the meeting. <clears throat> and I don't know if there's something in. Italian, there's a beautiful expression when you have a hoarse throat like I have now. They say that you swallowed a frog. So uh, I did not swallow a frog, but I sound like it, I know. So uh, I think you'll bear with me. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to you, Sophia, where minds meet online. Uh, we'll see the liability of uh, the loyalty of uh, Facebook, as I said earlier to you, Fabio, uh, 140 people said that they were going to come to the meeting tonight. And uh, there's one person that said she's not going to come to the meeting tonight, but here she is, and that's Cornelia. Cornelia had problems with her, with her computer, and, and uh, I told her that if she tells the computer that Fabio is not going to talk to him anymore, the computer will consent for her to communicate with us, and this is what happened. She talked to the computer, used your name, Fabio, now the computer is very nice and uh, friendly. Uh, Okay, and we have Eugenia. Eugenia had some problems about the time, but I see that we solved it. So anyhow, Fabio, it's a great pleasure having you back here with us. And uh, today we're going to continue our conversation about the... Somebody has dogs in the background, or...? me. <laughs> Okay, okay. I think, uh, yeah, what, what might be a good idea is that everybody that can and is not talking at this moment, please mute your mic so that we don't have uh, background noises and, uh, and echo, etc., etc. So uh, we're going to continue our conversation from the, the last time about the voyage of the violin uh, from myth from the mythology of time, uh, through passion, into passion, and the reason why I chose the word passion, it's the Latin sense of passione, uh, and uh, this brings us basically to the late 15th, early 16th century, 17th century, where the violin makes its entry into Christian and European music. Why is it happening like this? Before that, we had mainly singers, right? We had chorus that sang in the, in the church, and we had uh, some dances with uh, instruments, but we did not have instrument leading in music. What, 
why did it happen in the early 17th century, late 16th century, that the violin conquered such an important place? Also, perché, ma non ti sento, aspetta. Fabio? Non ti sento. Am I the only one? Uh, Luisa, I can't hear you either. But Luisa, your microphone is uh, uh, muted. Fabio, non so perché, non ti sento. Magari quando sono uscito dalla conferenza, ah, ecco, adesso dovrei sentire. Say something? No? I don't know, I can't hear you. Allora, <coughs> facciamo una cosa. Esco di nuovo, I'm going to leave the voice conference again, and Fabio, please go and try out the uh, equipment, the microphone, and the audio, okay? Uh, just a second, I have to leave the conference first here. Okay. Sì, 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 adesso perfetto. Bene, allora stavo dicendo, uh, uh, the first question yeah. is English or Italian? Whatever you feel like. Ok, Italian, you feel... Uh, English, I try, I try, because otherwise it's complicated. I think uh, the reason is because after the Middle Age era, uh, one uh, explosion, discovery, fantastic, new and exciting was the polyphony. So what happened between um, 140, 1400-1500, the Renaissance uh, era, was the explosion of polyphony and polyphony was, uh, of course, uh, voice. Because was, uh, voice was the... Uh, I can say the legal music was the <laughs> was the political correct music. So, of course, in the Renaissance, there was an explosion of uh, uh, vocal music, and sometimes just for evocating the quality of the vocal music, some uh, instrumental ensemble reproduced the the the. Um, vocal music and especially for example what is very important at this time end of renaissance beginning of the 17th century is the transcription of madrigali make from viola concert uh, one of the most popular instruments and family at this time was the viola da gamba uh, family including of course soprano contralto tenore basso and it was a, a very coherent sound in one way, was the best for uh, make transcription for the vocal music. So instruments very popular for us today, like uh, uh, violin. Of course, we talk about violin, but also wind player, wind instrument, uh, and also another string instrument was not so popular, just because the uh, most attractive music was the uh, evocation of vocal music. So you have. Uh, explosion of the Viola da Gamba family, and uh, it's amazing, but it's true uh, to consider that the violin, for example, in the end of Renaissance and beginning of uh, 17th century, was only, uh, not only, but 
more uh, for popular music than for uh, uh, serious music. So we we can found the name of the violin, for example, in uh, ballet music, a lot of ballet music. Uh, also, the violin make accompaniment for the puppet theater in the in the in the square around the, the Europe, and 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 was the instrument, the prince instrument for marriage, for uh, uh, meeting, for. Uh, Every 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 very popular manifestation of the people. Uh, um, it's particularly clear because, uh, for example, for example, also in the beginning of the uh, opera, uh, we talk about uh, Marco da Gagliano, Monteverdi Orfeo, for example. Um, um, the, the beginning of the, the opera uh, in, in Italy, it's very difficult to find the name violin before a pentagramma. We never know, but probably what happened in the Monteverdi opera when you found the famous Ritornelli, uh, it's, it's probably the family of Viola da Gamba. I, I imagine in Venezia, for example, but also in Rome with uh, uh, Landi, uh, and uh, this uh, composer in the beginning, beginning of opera, uh, Caccini and uh, Peri in Florence, then the Ritornelli was played from the Viola da Gamba family. Today we, we do a terrible mistake to play with the first violin, second violin, the Ritornelli, because it was not so popular, this instrument uh, was not popular was very popular in the sense that was of course a, a important instrument but not for the uh, serious music and this is probably the reason why some composers start to use the violin like uh, uh, strange thing a particular thing this is the reason why then i asked to you to listen Postente spirito in Monteverdi Orfeo, because he specified violini alla francese or violini piccoli, because it was a new instrument, it was a strange instrument, and it's it's fantastic. He used this instrument in opposite of uh, what happened in the society. So you can imagine the violin used for uh, holidays, for marriage, and for popular dance to be used in Pocente Spirito, the fantastic scena of Orfeo, when Orfeo tried to convince the spirit to give you back Euridice. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, I think it's, uh, for me, it's exciting because the instrument, uh, the two violin solo, it's uh, with two cornetti. Cornetti is the instrument of the heel, of the inferno, and art too. It's an instrument, uh, evocation, the sound of the primary Orfeo's instrument. Uh, so a pair of two violins, it's the beginning probably of a big revolution, then start in 17th century. Why? Because this is the reason uh, some virtuoso start to practice a lot this instrument to discover that was a great instrument for playing a lot of different music and probably uh, Monteverdi meet some fantastic violinists and decided to offer a piece in uh, in this important opera. Okay, I, I'm sorry I was muted. Please excuse my voice today, but it's kind of uh, something walking around in my throat. Anyhow, uh, um, I think it's a very interesting period uh, because of the innovation, as you say, of the new, uh, not new instrument, but the new introduction of the instrument. Uh, later on, we will listen also to the way Biagio Marini thought about having violin in your ear as an audience, but not to see it. You know, the, uh, the hidden 
il violino nascosto. Uh, let's listen to uh, Possente Spirito. By the way, Orfeo, in the opera it says, it's written, he holds a lyre, una lira, in his hand, not a violin. But uh, Monteverdi is one of the, in my book, uh, one of those great composers who sees the whole orchestra, the whole voices, everything. And he knows exactly how to, it's the first time that we actually listen to words with respect. And each and every one of the instruments has a respect, has a presence. So let's listen to uh, uh, this. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. Dan, yes. Dan, just one thing. It's important to say that uh, in, at this time, in the beginning of uh, 17th century and in the end of Renaissance, uh, the mito of Orfeo was close to the lira. Lira was a strange name at this time because lira in the Greek terms, it's uh, of course a plucked instrument, very little. Uh, we know the invention of the seven strings in the lira after the five strings. Uh, uh, and, and of course, lira was not possible uh, at this time because nobody played the, the ancient Greek lira. So the more close instrument was the arpa, but arpa was too big for um, invite Orfeo to <laughs> to walk with an instrument in the eel. But lira, it's also in the Renaissance a string instrument, very important. Uh, it's a, it comes from the viola da gamba family again, and the lirone, it's a bass instrument. Uh, with a, a, a plate, a bridge, uh, where you play uh, at the same time uh, seven, eight, or nine strings. So sounds like a organ. And it's a typical instrument for make a fantastic accompaniment for the voice. But the little instrument at the same in the same family, it's lira da braccio. Lira da braccio. It's exactly the same, but little play in uh, like a violin. This is the reason why the iconography at this time uh, show Orfeo to play an instrument then the profan said it's a violin, it's not a violin, it's a lira da braccio. It's a typical instrument for make accompaniment of the voice. Uh, and this is the reason why the iconography uh, at this time, it's every time uh, reproduce Orfeo with a string instrument. It's not a violin, it's a lira. Braccio. It's a pity, for example, that today we don't use this instrument because it's a fantastic instrument and you can have a finger sing and play at the same time. It's great. It's exactly like the Orfeo Mito. I don't understand why nobody thought about having an electric lira. We have a, an electric guitar. Why not have an electric lira? It's a bad joke, I know. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, something strange and curious, in the Bible, in Hebrew, David, he became King David when he was still the seducer of King Saul, the old king, the spirit, in Hebrew, the violin, the 70, you know, the translation of the 70 wise man, man. translated the Bible from the Bible because they knew they didn't know what it was. Not to know exactly what by man in the Bible because they didn't have any instrument like that in Egypt, for example, that uh, saw it. And the Hebrew, the Jews, could not produce any drawings. It says that in the Bible, you shall not reproduce any drawings. So we don't know what the violin was in, in the time of, uh, of King David, but it, it's curious that in the Bible, in Hebrew, it says violin, and because of the translation into Greek, they had the lira. Uh, we all know it in, in Latin and in Italian, etc. 
cetera, et cetera. We all have it as lira and not as the violin. The violin actually comes from the bigger family, of, obviously, the, uh, of the bass uh, and viola. And uh, let's listen to the one I found, and I found it on YouTube, and I think it's interesting because we can actually see the people that play it. Uh, I found it, uh, it's uh, directed by Jordi Saval, and uh, so please, everybody, if you can mute yourself, and uh, I'll send it for us to listen and watch. So we had Cosente Spirito, Claudio Monteverdi.
I thought to stop it here uh, because it's, it's uh, very, very beautiful. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of uh, material prepared for this evening. And, uh, it's, a, um, got... it's, a, it's a masterpiece, huh? It's so beautiful. It's incredible. But... It's so beautiful. And it's the moment when the violin starts to be a prince. In the, in the, you know, in the parking of the instrument. For me, it's so important because it delimitates the beginning of the classical era of the, of the violin. It's, it's extremely important. It's extremely important. If you share this sound with viola da gamba in the orchestra, it's even better because the apparition of the violin in, in Orfeo just a little, you know, it's when you open the window and the air comes inside. It's completely new. It's for the first time. It's great because I think it was probably a big inspiration for a lot of the composer after. This is the reason why Biagio Marini and Uccellini and, and a lot of composer uh, start to be in love of this instrument. They finally realized that it was uh, very deep instrument, able to uh, show every different feeling in the human uh, mind. That's that's really very important for me. What what I uh, admire and enjoy so much, <coughs> sorry, in this piece, uh, in everything that uh, Monteverdi wrote in that period. But what is so incredible is for the first time that we have different characters, different moods, uh, spiriti diversi. Because when we have the violin, we, also, we always have the feeling, at least I do, that Orfeo feels that he has a chance. He can hope. And then when the uh, wind instruments come in, it's as if it's an awakening, you know, uh, 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 don't hope so fast. And then uh, we have uh, the, the harp, which is also bringing us back. And only when the, vi when the two violins come back, do we feel again that there is hope, that there is something to, to look forward to. And uh, yeah, of course, we have Marini and uh, look, uh, Uccellini, but... I, I don't like to say, you know, one is better than the other. It's, it's always... Uh, no, but, no of course, uh, of course. But it's, it's a fantastic show of the uh, process in the 17th century. In the beginning, the relation is symbology and sound. But it's exactly the same for the voice. At this time, when Orfeo sings, and when Didone sing in, in San Cassiano in Venezia, and, and the... And the public opera start in, in 1637 in Venezia. The voice was not the prince. The voice was a medium for show the different symbology of the uh, necessity of the human life. And then what happened after, the audience start to be in love about the voice and the voice starts to be virtuoso. And virtuoso is also a different uh, show of uh, think, uh, capacity and blah, blah, blah. And for the instrument, it's exactly the same. At this time in Orfeo, violence, it's a symbology and then starts to be show of the capacity. And with Uccellini, with uh, um, Marini and with different composer, the 17th century is full of great virtuoso violin, starts to be a sort of, uh, well, I, I think it's uh, it's uh, uh, you can say in English in Italian we say uh, corruption, corruzione of the beginning of of the sense of this music. This music. You mean like, corruption like, in the sense of the Lusconi, something like that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It was like uh, in the beginning was the reproduction of the Greek tragedy, and then starts to be the show my capacity, I am a big virtuoso, I am able to play fantastic violin, so I don't care about the symbology of my instrument, I want just that you applaud to me because I am the most important violinist. And, and we will see this 
with the next piece like Marini, Corelli, Uccellini, because it's, uh, yeah, it's in, in one way it's, it's a corruption, it's a nice corruption, it's not like Berlusconi, uh, but, uh, but it's a nice corruption, but it's also the end of uh, a very pure time in the music, the time when uh, the most important thing was the symbology of the music and not the, the instrument or the voice and blah, blah, blah. You know, we tend to forget that even in the verbal usage of the words, virtuoso, we have a corruption. Because virtuoso comes from virtu, and uh, it comes from something that is good, and it's not the amount and speed of notes you can play per minute, uh, you know, like uh, we have so many geniuses that can play seven million uh, notes in uh, two minutes, and, uh, and, and you know, there's no music, there's just a lot of noise, uh, a lot of notes, but uh, it's such a pity because virtuoso is not something who is mechanical, who is an engineer of, of plucking the fingers, it's somebody who has virtue, who has, uh, anyhow. So, you uh, same, yeah, you say the same today in Italy. You say, tu sei un virtuoso, in the sense of the purity. You are yeah, clean yeah, inside. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, well, you know, like uh, what we discussed earlier, that, uh, that today Stradivari was sold for something like, I don't know, $15 million. And, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you appreciate a piece that is 35 centimeters long, <laughs> and that is about 250 years old, uh, how do you give it a price? You know, the whole thing is a corruption of the symbology, the, the, the corruption of the icon. You know, the uh, Stradivari is not an instrument anymore. Uh, Stradivari is first of all an icon. And there are so many uh, places in the world where if you are very good and you win a competition, a violin competition, for example, you will get, for one year, you will get a Stradivari or a Del Gesù or something like that. It's an icon, you know. Uh, you are now in the family that can allow yourself. It's something that is nice, folkloristic, but it doesn't have much to do with the appreciation of the wealth, uh, il tesoro che si chiama veramente la musica nella profondità della musica, no? la musica nel, nell'esternità. It's not the exterior music that is important. And we have such a fantastic lesson with uh, Monteverdi because he has all the time in the world. You know, there's, uh, there's no hurry. He allows you to develop slowly, slowly into the mood and and, uh, and of course, the passages of the violin, uh, it's like, you know, uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein used to say that uh, every composer surprises you, you know, because you listen to uh, the music of Mozart or uh, Bach or Brahms or whatever, and they always surprise you, but you can always think that there might be a different note to follow. With Beethoven, Bernstein says, it's always his choice. The choice that Beethoven did is always the best. It's surprising. And whether it's true or not about Beethoven, it's definitely true with, uh, uh, with Monteverdi, who really, it's not only the music that surprises you, it's the structure of the instrument, uh, the way that he combines the different sound with the sound of the of the figure. It's I the think. difference. It's the difference between affetti and effetti. That's a very important difference in terms of words, and uh, the difference between mito. We 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 say it violino fra mito e. E passione. Uh, it's also interesting the difference between mito and passione. Also, it's a show of uh, 
corruption process. And we are involved now in a terrible corrupt process also in music. The difference between business and cultura, for example. Yeah, well, uh, on this, <laughs> obviously we can spend a lot of time. Yeah. But uh, there's one thing that I think has to be said. Uh, the political management, uh, governments all over the world always want to carry the torch of culture. They always want to say, ah, we are cultured, we have this, we have this, we have that. But when it comes down to the people that actually have to do the work in the field, the Istituti di Cultura, the Institutes of Culture, be it the French, the American, the Italian, whatever, they always come back to you and say, we don't have a budget. They never come back to you and say, let's build a program that means something, that has culture in it. No, it's whether we do have the budget open for next year or it's already closed uh, with, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, we will not go into politics. Yeah, it's I, complicated. It's, it's a large, large, large discussion about this. Yeah, but in any case, uh, from this time, of course, the people will be very excited about the capacity of this instrument. In in the beginning of 17th century, uh, the violin was played uh, more or less in first position in a very uh, easy uh, solution in technical way, and then rapidly they discovered there was a fantastic instrument for show virtuoso capacity in the in the performance and blah blah blah. So the composer was more and more interesting about dedicate piece for violin. There is a moment in Confucian where uh, winds and strings was uh, sailed at the same moment. You have a lot of sonata for flauto o violino. Uh, violino o cornetto of course, because it was easier to sell the music and make money. Again, the corruption <laughs> starts. Uh, but what is true and interesting, a lot of virtuoso coming and start to be uh, very popular. And we, we can talk about a lot of uh, uh, composer violins like Biagio Marini and Fontana and blah, blah, blah. And they probably make a big revolution in terms of uh, evolution, technical evolution in the instrument. We start to have a lot of combination, bows, a solution, uh, colpi d'arco, and uh, articulation, different position. Rep for example, it's amazing, but from Monteverdi or Feo, when, for example, the violin never go up to the first position, in 10 years or 15 years, you have pieces that go in four, five position in a very high uh, combination for the violin, double stop it uh, and uh, uh, different combination arpeggi. It's, it's really a big revolution. And we can listen this uh, after Monteverdi, after 20, 25 years from the first composer dedicated to violin, this uh, incredible uh, evolution um, that make probably in very short time the violin one of the prints of the instrument it was one of the most popular. And then you start to uh, see also in the vocal music finally in in the in the score we read violini uh, due violini soli. Uh, for example, this is typical from the pupil of uh, Monteverdi. Francesco Cavalli, it's a fantastic composer, beautiful. Uh, the ritornelli of the aria or the accompaniamenti of the aria uh, around the years 160, 40, 45, uh, 50, 55, start to uh, put due violini soli. It's uh, finally the, the, <laughs> the la conquista e conquistata. Uh, we also have and I would like, after we listen to Viaggio Marini, I would like to talk about the divisions, you know, of uh, play 
the violin, teach the violin, write for the violin, uh, play the instrument, be a teacher of the instrument. And in the period that we're talking about, there were always the same people. Uh, Marini, uh, by the way, Marini, as you know, did write per due corde, to two strings. Uh, not always mentioning the word. I don't know, maybe he wasn't sure that violino is selling uh, enough. But uh, let's talk about it after we listen to, if, you, if it's okay with you. Uh, let's listen to uh, Pietro Marini in uh, a piece that is called uh, For Free Violins. But uh, the interesting thing here, and we'll talk about it afterwards, is that the way that Pietro Marini gave instructions how the instruments should be placed on stage, what you see, what you do not see, uh, and that's quite interesting. Let me take the opportunity to say hello to all the uh, friends that joined us uh, let me see who we have. Ah, we have Barbara. Ciao, Barbara. Come stai? Tutto bene? You can unmute your mic, Barbara. Oh, here we are. Ci dici qualche cosa? No. Okay. And we have Carol. I forgot to tell you, uh, Fabio. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol from Pennsylvania found out that you are her uncle. So it's between the two of you. I don't know how it happened. But that's okay. Say it's your zio. No, Sono su? Say lo zio di Carol. Carol ha trovato che... Eh, non so. Ha trovato che la sensazione, l'emozione che eh, trova per te è possibile soltanto in famiglia, quindi ha deciso che sei il suo zio. Ma questo è bellissimo. Io devo dire una cosa a uh, Carol, but I don't know in which language. Uh, you speak in your language, or I'll translate oh, it Carol, to Carol. Sorry for my poor English. It's great because, you know, I am Italian and we are very close to the concept of family. Uh, especially I, I come from Sicily. But what's happened by me and in my mind is I'm not very exciting about the family. I mean, I have a fantastic family. I love everybody. But I think love, uh, it's uh, its important to uh, every day for friends, for parents, you try to convince the other about your love and you take the love from the others for many, many reasons, concrete reasons. So for my uncle, for me, especially uncle, it's one of the most uh, uh, far away in my in my family, so I am not particularly love my uncle, and I think it's so beautiful that you you have this feeling with me because it's a good uh, you can say in English then rivendicazione familiare. It's the re uh, re with the, re, re uh, how can I say it in English. Uh, the, well, let's call it the resurrection of the familial uh, feelings. Uh, we also have Dan. Olga here. Yes. Dan, for dire claiming, claiming, reclaiming, reclaiming, yes. Mm -hmm. Reclaiming, yes, you're right. Ciao, Barbara. Ci dici qualche cosa, Barbara? Barbara, dici qualcosa che non sentiamo niente. Vabbè, abbiamo, uh, we have also Holger here with us. Ciao, Holger. Uh, and, uh, of course, Holger sits there and he has sun at uh, 9.30 in the evening. And uh, we don't have sun here. We have Josta with us. Uh, Josta, could you tell us a little bit where you come from? And uh, it's uh, not the first time you're with us, but I've never heard your voice, just uh, okay. Well, let me see if I can. Uh, Josta, can you say something? No. 
Okay. Uh, we said that we have Lorenzo, we have uh, Octaviana, and we have Padme. I have no idea how you pronounce it. Uh, do I pronounce it correctly, Padme? Okay. Okay, anyhow. So, uh, let us all sit back. Mute our microphones, please. All our microphones. And... Uh, back and enjoy quite an interesting uh, group of uh, musicians, uh, a young group of musicians from, uh, ah, okay, Josta has problems with the microphone. Where are you from, Josta? Can you write where you're from? Italy, Trieste, okay. So, ciao. Italia, Ciao, Trieste, near Slovenia, yeah. Okay. So let's listen to Piatro uh, Marini, Sonata in Echo for Free Violence. Please.
was a, a very nice. Uh, it's a group from San Francisco. They're called the Voices of Music. Uh, the uh, lady on the violin is the leader of the group and also the teacher. Uh, I mean, she started off as their professor. And uh, but what is interesting is that uh, we have a theater here. We have, have the idea of an uh, messengina. Uh, we have the echo. Yeah, uh, we have we have a. Uh, it's a great combination. You know why? For two reasons. The first reason is it's very uh, exciting. It's theater. It's full theater. It's incredible. So it's it's extremely exciting for the audience, but but it's very pure because the concept of echo is very ancestral, and again the contact and the feeling it's from the Orfeo Mito, and this is great because Marini show in this case a great combination between what is new and what is the respect of the past. Because the the idea of the echo it's a very ancestral and and I can say uh, ancestral it's in the radici of the humanity and this is particularly nice uh, it's a good example bravo Dan well, you told me one movement of the sonata well, I, and I thought you, this is I told you Marini but that's, not, <laughs> that's your choice it's nice. I was, uh, I, I love the piece, I love the piece, it's a beautiful piece, and I was very surprised to find this young group of uh, players, because uh, again, you know, what I find so refreshing in the way that they perform this piece is that there's humility, you know, it's humbleness, there's no, uh, there's no show off, it's, it's music for the sense for the sake of music, and I, I liked it, so I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, let's try, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, why is it that as we came ahead with time, there was a division, more and more a division between the player, the teacher, and the composer, because there was no way that uh, Bach could only write, or Buxtehudi uh, only teach, or it was always the or Vivaldi, or why is it that we became more and more specialized? I think, uh, uh, well, the difference also is before the printed music and the manuscript music. This is concerning Vivaldi, Locatelli, a lot of composers. For me, the real key is that we don't understand completely the music without the composer and the performer. Uh, there is many, many cases in the 18th century, for example, also for the vocal music. The people say in Venice, for example, that it was impossible to perform Marcello without Marcello, because Marcello know exactly how realize his music. I think in one way uh, the printed music is the music for the humanity, the manuscript music is the every time music where the key disappear unfortunately. So we try to understand the good way but we probably never know. I think uh, the music play from directly from the composer was another thing. It, it's uh, 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 lost paradise for, for us today. Uh, I can imagine uh, uh, the music of Marini without Marini. In, in another way, for example, I'm frustrated sometimes when I uh, start to uh, work a piece of uh, Uccellini or Marini or Monteverdi, because, for example, in terms of uh, agogic solution, we never know exactly how was uh, the good tempi and the good tempi, it's, it's extremely interesting to, uh, so uh, I think we must be accept that in, in one way, uh, this music was not wrote for the humanity, was wrote in the moment for us, for a kind to play that was, of course, very personal. 
you know that for example today i i just uh, read the sometimes i like to read this book it's the uh, lithography of uh, uh, pierre leone Gedi. i don't know if you know this it's great because it's been painting from the rome in the beginning of uh, 18th century it's a great uh, painting and with a lot of commentary about uh, uh, the musical life at this time. And there is a portrait of Tibaldi. Tibaldi is a violinist, a thousand of violins was painting by Leone Gezzi and some name it's uh, of really unknown for, for us. Tibaldi was a, a pupil of Corelli. It's interesting because uh, what uh, Pier Leoneghetti wrote in, in the painting is, uh, this is Maestro Tibaldi, a violinist in Rome uh, uh, that play in many orchestra in Rome between 171 and 1713. And now uh, is not very demanding for the orchestra because his play is too old for the style. And the painting is 17020, so it's seven years after that he was a la moda. He started to be not a la moda, and the people don't want to listen play in the style of Corelli because it was too old. It's it's frustrating because I mean uh, it's it's uh, some some years after Corelli, and then immediately the the feeling of the audience changed. So uh, Tibaldi disappeared completely, and then he. It, he was invited again in, in some performance later. But what what is interesting, it's understand that uh, the music life in the 18th century and 17th century was so fast that we can imagine. At which point everything was finished, uh, forget, and put in the rubbish because it was too old and not uh, the same commentary we have for uh, Maddalena Lombardini Silmans, the famous pupil of Tartini. Uh, this girl was a great violinist. We know from the commentary of Tartini. We have the famous letter to Tartini to her about how practice the violin, the trilli, the bows, blah blah blah. And then in 177 T. Uh, in uh, in Paris, in the Concert Spirituel, uh, Maddalena played, and the critics was, oh, she's nice, and of course she played good. She's one of the most uh, important uh, pupil of Tartini, but in any case, it's too old for us now, and she, uh, she uh, she's too old. This kind to play, it's uh, just finished today, so we have, we don't have really. Uh, good commentary about this because it's uh, it's just no it's just no it's uh, no no way to make so it, uh, I think also uh, probably uh, during the life of, of a virtuoso composer the music was respect and with the died of the violin composer the music also died with the composer and we see this for many many cases for example Vivaldi it's a typical uh, in terms of violinist, he was one of the most important in Italy. And then rapidly, when we uh, when we know that he finished his career like violinist, his music, instrumental music, comes to do old and not play around the world, except the printed music. The printed music is interesting because you can find a difference of style between the manuscript music and the printed music. music the printed music is for the capacity of the humanity. It just make for make money. It's just for show a language, but the manuscript music sometimes it's more interesting because it's a, the good mirror or of uh, the real personality of the composer. Yeah, well, the printed music was something that, uh, as you say, it's where you made money because uh, I, I would like to uh, break to the understanding of everybody that the printed music was not something as we have it today, that printed music is only for musicians. Printed music was for the families. You would buy printed music, sit with the daughter that played the uh, violin and uh, uh, the uh, clavicembalo, and uh, you will play it in the family. It's, 
it's like the CD today, you know, it's like the difference between going to a concert and having the CD. Um, people used to know how to read music, and that was the way to enjoy music if you did not have the chance to go uh, to, the, uh, to the concert hall. Another thing, I, I'm trying to understand why is it that we are so fortunate, we are so lucky today to have the revival of so many things. If, you know, if I think about Compositore uh, Completamente Quasi, Sconosciuto Vivaldi, disappeared completely. Uh, Bach, not completely, but you know, when, uh, when Friedrich Emanuel was famous, uh, Johann Sebastian was all, already a legend, but he was old. Uh, you know, when the king came and uh, he got the message that, uh, yes, he's good, but it was finished. And, you know, Mendelssohn felt that he had to write uh, accompagnamenti for the uh, pieces for solo. Why is it that today we have the wealth, we have the uh, the rich possibility to enjoy music in so many different ways? We have the authentic music, we have the... Uh, uh, why do you think it happened in 1950, more or less, that we have a revival of authenticity in music. It's a big, big question. Uh, you talk about Mendelssohn, you talk about, uh, I talk, for example, in the beginning of 20th century, the revival of the violin music from uh, Veracini, Geminiani, the David School, for example, the famous uh, David violinist that uh, take again the old Baroque sonata and make some collection of his music. You know, I have a terrible answer, probably very, <laughs> very hard to understand. Uh, for me, uh, in one way, there is an answer about the context. Uh, of course, Mendelssohn was interesting for many, many reasons to recuperate uh, um, Bach, but at the same, I, at the same uh, uh, reason why uh, he wrote again sacred music in the Handel style, if you consider it Saul or Helia, the famous oratory of Mendelssohn is make with the old style because he considered this in the sacred music probably um, still in the 19th century the better uh, solution for the sacred music. Uh, so of course the revival of Bach. The revival of Bach is interesting because for example next year I will be performing the Matteo, Matthäus Passion of uh, oh. Bach in the Mendelssohn but not in the late uh, edition of Mendelssohn, when Mendelssohn changed the recitativi with, uh, uh, he don't use the cembalo, but he do an orchestration with two cellos, the contrabassi and clarinet. We do the um, edition uh, 180-28 by, uh, um, from Sing Academy in Berlin, when Mendelssohn played the pianoforte in, in the place of the cembalo. It's interesting. Uh, to approach this music with a little romantic uh, pattern and show how uh, this music uh, resists also to a different style like the Baroque style. It's, it's, it's an interesting process to think about. But uh, to come back to you, your question, I think uh, the reason why we uh, go back now and we have this warm revival of the Baroque music is because we are collapsed in the musical uh, life today. We don't have any solution. We, have, we don't have future. So it's exactly like the gastronomy. It, do you think uh, the question is, why the publicity about food? 18% of publicity of food, it's come back to the past. The real ingredient, the true ingredient of the bread, uh, the, set, the pure food, it's exactly the same thing. We are fascinated about the modern solution. It's, it's, ha, it's, uh, habe genug. We, it's, ne abbiamo abbastanza. It's too hard to follow the crazy society. So we, we, we try to have a little comfort, uh, 
a secret garden when to be sure and go back to the past because the past is uh, nostalgic it's safety in one way what's happened in the past they they was not like uh, us uh, what was important was the progress go uh, in in another a new solution found a new solution for our instrument found a new solution for our language revolution in every country and in every time for music about language technique and blah 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 today we collapsed so it's it's too late uh, and there is there are not space for change the thing so we go back to the past because the past is is comfortable it's like a warm pillow uh, so i think this is probably the 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 reason why of course we are interesting uh, we are specialized today to investigate, especially in this, some argument that's good, uh, but there is also a psychological answer. What what I think is is um, found a good comfort for a difficult society and difficult. Uh, uh, I, yeah, you you understand what I mean. I I think that uh, we live more in a confused society than a different society. It's a society that has answers for everything, but forgot about the questions. Uh, you know, you if you start, you want to know something today, you don't go to a book, you, go, you Google it, you know, and whatever comes up is the right answer. And the answers are all there, but how to match the question with the answer and how to go deeper and deeper and find more questions and more answers mm. you don't you know everything is too fast and yeah what i find fast. so incredible yeah it's too fast but also block it in another way yes. uh, you know for example when i was invited the first time in the Le mr leonard gustav leonard house when i was young I, I was very happy of course because i meet for the first time marie leonard and and, and the maestro, and they offered to me a tea uh, with original cups and, and, and spoons. It's great. I understand perfectly because I love this historical moment, but in another way, it's a little pathological. It's pathological because it's a refuse of the modern society in one way. Uh, when I tell you about the food, we want to eat again the good chicken the farm chicken, and sometimes we are disappointed because the farm chicken is hard. The, the meat is very hard. It's not so sweet like the, the, what we, we eat normally. It's because, of course, the farm uh, chicken, it's, it's a different taste, a different, uh, and, and we are not habituated. Uh, the gut strings in the instrument, we want to use the gut strings, but the gut strings broken, so it's, it's difficult for the modern society because we can't broken the strings during the contest because the audience don't like that we tuning or we retuning or we put again strings in the middle of a movement. But that's what's happened in the 18th century, in the 17th century. So we was used the same material with a modern concept. It's it's extremely dangerous. It's uh, I think in one way it's also a moment of confusion. So we we. Uh, I believe in the progress of the humanity. I think we must be respect the original words and the original uh, methodology and the original uh, vocabulary uh, without forget that we are people of the 21st century and we, we can't go back to the 18th century because the context is completely different. So come back to your question about uh, uh, the, this is my answer. But also come back to the next uh, answer, uh, question about the composer. I think also that in one way we must be accept that we don't know completely the real key and the right key for instance some music. And sometimes it's absolutely obvious. Uh, when I play a violin concerto of Vivaldi, for example, there is a lot of concerti manuscript from La Pietà you start to read, I read a lot of violin concerti of Vivaldi because I, I, I try to make new programs. 
And sometimes it's impossible because you understand that some concerti are just composed for save a technical problem for a little girl from La Pietà. The little uh, Maria had problem with the double strings and everybody wrote a concerto for double strings. Sometimes musically it's not very interesting, but it's an exercise. It's impossible for no, for us today accept that a piece is just an exercise, especially when, when it's signed by uh, Antonio Vivaldi. We think ah, it's a big opera d'arte. It's not like this. It's quotidian life. It's what's happen every day. That's also very interesting. Well, it's, uh, we should not forget that Johann Sebastian Bach wrote the uh, well-tempered clavier just to make sure that the clavicembal is well-tuned. Exactly. And, and so, exactly. Uh, and we, yeah, and we make a process of meter in some piece, and it's not the case. Uh, concerning the 17th century in violin, for example, in Modena, we discovered, not we, not me, but uh, a lot of musicologists, we discovered a Fondo with a lot of feats for solo violin. Toccate really? and yeah, Toccate and Richard Cari. It's from the Lantoni. It's the Bologna and Modena school in the years between 1670 and 1690 of uh, 17th century. Uh, so they print the music. Of course, it was very exciting. Ah, Fondo solo violin part. You can't play. Because it's just exercise. <laughs> there is not any interesting in terms of music. And are good composer. Why? Because the violinist needs exercise. So somebody must be wrote exercise for the little uh, violinist. So uh, I don't know. I think it's exciting. It's nice. But we must be at the capacity to share between what is really uh, opera d'arte and what is really uh, part of uh, natural process in the quotidian life. I don't know why I was muted. I'm sorry about that. But I saw that I was muted. So he uh, didn't lose much. I was saying that today uh, it's just amazing to be able to. Uh, it has to be and, uh, and, uh, as you say, sometimes you find a piece uh, of Tartini wrote just for, for, for an exercise, and that's it. It, 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 it. He doesn't remember where he got from or whatever. I would like to uh, uh, go over this. I would like to. Something happens here. What? Can I you want hear to, me? Oh. I want to just say hello to Anne, my favorite singer in the world. Ah, Anne is with us. Ah. Hi, Anne. Let me, let me see who else we have here with us. So, okay, so we have Lorenzo, Olga, just and uh, Fabio Biondi, Eugenia, Carol, Barbara, Baraktal. Uh, hi, Barak. Baraktal, by the way, is uh, a very gifted young conductor uh, of the Tel Aviv soloists. It's a very nice concept. 
they don't have an ensemble of fixed players. They have an ensemble of the concept of music, and you always choose the soloist to play the different pieces. So it's very nice to have you with us here, uh, Barak. Uh, you promised you were going to come, and you did come. I can't see Anna. Am I missing something? And it's close to Olga. Ah, okay. Uh, I I was looking at the names. I was looking at... No, no, okay. it's with Olga. <laughs> okay. So, good evening, Ann. It's, again, very good to have you here with us. Ah, now I see you. Now I see you. Okay. okay. Why did you allow Holger to put only his name? Anyhow. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, continue with our program and go to uh, Marco Uccelli, that's okay. And uh, the piece I chose here, I chose it and you'll tell us a little bit about it if it's okay with you. I have a problem here with it. Anyhow. The piece that I chose is La Pergamasca. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about this, because uh, there are so many different compositions of instruments to play it. Uh, Bergamasca is a typical piece uh, made from the, uh, sometimes from a basso uh, part or for a melody. This is the reason why a lot of uh, 17th century piece, especially instrumental, was colored with different titles. Uh, there is a lot, a lot in every collection of Marini, Uccellini, we have a little, of, uh, a lot of titles. Comes from the tema of uh, some popular dance or uh, some basso. And I, I don't remember exactly, but I think for the Bergamasca it's a typical basso part. Um, I think it's maybe better that you you send the music and then we will do a little comment. Okay, fantastic. So we are going to listen to a piece by Marco Cellini called La Bergamasca. And again, we have the young ensemble of musicians from San Francisco, the Voices of Music. So please use your microphones. And
Okay. Uh, yeah, it's variation from a basso. It's obvious. It's a basso part of a bergamacca, and then you have a sort of prolegion for the violin. And I think about the agogical solution, the tempi. It's interesting because uh, you know, for example, uh, in the last uh, two years of my life, I, I I think a lot about the tempi. If it's too fast, if it's too slow. What is the better solution? Sometimes we boring when you play. Sometimes and we play very fast because we think that it's more interesting. Sometimes uh, share the music with the singers is extremely important because the singers give you sometimes the good choice because there is a sort of physiological uh, decision uh, when we when we make opera with Anne, for example, in Agrippina, we decide the tempi. Sometimes it's physiological, and you you arrive to decide the good tempo because it you feel that it's the good tempo because it's the good tempo for sing, it's the good tempo for say the text. But with the instrumental music, sometimes it's it's difficult. And again, we have the uh, question mark. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the composer, so we don't know. But probably also for the composer depends in in a lot of terms. About the uh, reflection of the music in the whole, it was a, a church, it was a whole, um, and a lot of uh, of elements. It's, uh, for example, for me, I feel in this uh, recording of La Bergamasca a sort of uh, enjoy to play. I remember to have played a very similar piece in the similar uh, repertoire and play with the violins very fast because you enjoy and, and, and you are very happy to play the fast part fast, but it's not uh, necessarily the good choice for the music, but it's a good choice for you. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting because, of course, uh, it's the explosion of the instrumental uh, school for the violin, Uccellini. It's just before Corelli, so we understand the fire that's coming in the in the technique of the violin, but uh, a lot of elements are also important to consider it about uh, the agogical solution and also other things. I mean, it's not a commentary about this performance. It's it's just global thinking. Um, I would like to take the opportunity here uh, and. Uh, between eight feet and ten feet. Because a lot of people tend to confuse the two the terms rhythm and ten feet. What is the difference? Uh, we know that uh, in the Baroque, left foot for the player, for the For the singer, for the player, uh, this is uh, actually uh, uh, all the temp here. Uh, uh, everything was invented. What is the difference between temp and rhythm? Can you? Then I, I, must, I must ask you to do again your question because your voice is very complicated at the moment and we have a lot of cut and uh, sounds strange the connection so I don't know why but uh, you was cut a lot of time sorry oh I'm sorry can you hear me now now it's perfect okay uh, I I asked a lot of people who use the uh, me with tempi difference between rhythm and tempi. Can you? Uh, I, I, I can, as you can see from the face of Luisa, that she's suffering. Do I break mm -hmm. up again? No, no, that's okay. For me, it's enough. Rhythm and tempi. Rhythm, it's a lot of uh, uh, technical things. Rhythm, it's solution about uh, uh, combination of uh, different patterns. If the rhythm was a rhythm lombardo, a typical um, uh, topoi in the 
in the 17th century used for the instrumental music. If it's right that uh, the composer put this in the beginning of sonata, it's right to follow until the end of the movement or not. The rhythmical problem is uh, sometimes, for example, uh, in the end of 17th century, the French style, double point or not double point, uh, uh, we reconsider it today. It's extremely interesting. I'm very excited about this uh, um, argument. Uh, that's probably wrong that we you, you make a sort of uh, a political courage to play everything double point because the probably was not like this. Uh, we start to uh, think now that probably share double point with quavers. It's also right because it's exactly what the composer needs. Uh, it's it's a big uh, mistake to consider it that the composer uh, was not able to put in every moment what they need, double or not that double, because we we know that it was possible. Uh, Bach is very clear about this, but also Handel. So to play alla francese in a very strictly term of uh, uh, double point in every overture alla francese, it's not really very intelligent. And then also consider it if the French piece was dedicated to the French performance or England performance or Italian performance. I mean, it's a big, it's a big argument. And this is concerning ritmo. But uh, tempi is the agogical solution. And the agogical solution is another big word. Uh, we must be decided for a, a lot of uh, uh, elements. Also, probably, um, think that the music at this time was organized and make in in a very different context and sometimes in a very quickly time. Uh, stupid example then, for example, uh, Agrippina of Handel. When you uh, make three days of rehearsals, the first time in Teatro Grimani of Venice, with a different, a very difficult score, because it's a difficult score, uh, with Margherita Durastanti singing in third with the oboe, a very fast uh, um, part in some areas, uh, we must be considered that the singer, she was very close to the oboe, she sing in proscenio, the tempi was probably not very fast, because more fast is more difficult is to be together. I mean, uh, tempi, concerning a lot of reflection, not only in terms of what you need, what you feel in the piece, but also what is right, more or less. Uh, probably I accept uh, to uh, understand that sometimes we play too fast. We, in terms of uh, Fabio, but a lot of performance, uh, normally um, we, we enjoy to use very fast tempi in the Italian music because we show a sort of capacity. Uh, we are very virtuoso and uh, uh, latent and, uh, uh, you can say in Italian, estroversi. But sometimes we must be very careful because it's probably not a good solution every time. So when you decide you decide in terms of harmonical thing. In Vivaldi, for example, that's true sometimes in the opera. It's so uh, stupid in a harmonical way. Uh, it never changed the harmony, uh, the tonality. So you start a aria in D major and the D major dur during uh, five bars. So of course you need to arrive in the A major at least uh, just for change. So the Fast tempi in some music like Vivaldi are sometimes welcome because uh, you help the harmony, uh, but you must you mustn't codify this uh, this language because sometimes it's very dangerous for other Italian music like Corelli or Scarlatti because of course the Napolitan and Roman school are completely different to the Venetian school, so it's it's a long process but fun fundamental. Uh, the difference between the ritmo and tempo is this. The, uh, I would like to add one point, especially based on uh, your way of interpreting the, above all, Venetian music. Uh, 
you have a way of giving me the sensation that a new rhythm, a new introduction opens up a new world. When you play Lestate di Vivaldi, you start in a certain way and everybody waits for the music actually to become something else. And then all of a sudden you smile and the music becomes something else. So, uh, uh, and it doesn't always happen, as you know. Uh, very many people did Patro Stagioni after, you know, after you introduced it, what, in 1996, I think, no? No, 93. When, what was the first time that you introduced Quattro Stagioni di Pardi? When they start to perform Quattro Stagioni, it's uh, 45. Yeah. No, no, you, you. I'm in uh, a, uh, 89. 89. Uh, well, after that, you know, we had so many. Yeah. I'm not going to go into all the names. But with very little, with very few of the other performers, at least I have this sensation that every time you play the music, you enjoy it again. And you find find something new, you know, it's like, uh, I used to love getting lost in, in Venice, and I know Venice quite well, and sometimes I come to Venice and I miss the virginity of being able to get lost again, and it seems that you have the pleasure of getting lost and finding yourself again every time you play, uh, Well, not only Vivaldi, I find it with Tartini also, but with Vivaldi, he said something once that he was uh, uh, a road you know, to enjoy the music of Vivaldi. Uh, I don't know if you remember, you said that Stravinsky was right about saying that Vivaldi wrote 120 times the same music because it took a long time to rediscover that the music of Vivaldi needs an act of love. And without the act of love, uh, it's boring. It's, uh, you say it, it's stupid music. And uh, it's so, I find it so, uh, so beautiful to be able to treat music not only as something to, you know, to make itself popular fish mm. and have a lot of success with other sex, but uh, it's an act of love to the music itself, which yeah, I find it's, uh, it's, very interesting. It's, no, it's, it's a very interesting answer. It's very complicated uh, question. It's very complicated to answer it in English for me. I can try, but I'm not sure to... Uh, to to have the capacity to uh, answer because it's a big question. First, I try to be very, uh, I mean, uh, short in my answer. First, uh, there is a, um, um, I can say, a, a sort of uh, dichotomy in the answers because in one way for play, uh, for enjoy and for make an act of love, You must be very uh, um, you must be very big to com to 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 compare the music. You must be dominate the music. We we must be very prepared and very strong, and and then we can improvise and we can take risk, of course, because uh, play or sing completely in control is safety, but it's boring. Uh, when we play or we play and sing together, uh, we do Agrippina. I just watch Anne, Anne watch me and we smile and we take some risk, it's beautiful. But you must be very in power for do this. So in one way, it's a sort of domination of the music. But in another way, uh, be careful because the terms domination, it's uh, dangerous. Uh, 
because when you are too much uh, uh, strong, you manipulate the music, you use the music for show your capacity, it's wrong. So it's a very uh, strategical and very uh, um, delicate balance between uh, uh, capacity, power and respect of the music. But of course, especially for Italian music, you can't do without this. Otherwise, it's boring again. It's boring because in some school, the music is very poor, uh, especially in the Venetian music. I don't talk about Roman or Napolitan, but Vivaldi, it's impossible to perform without this power. This capacity to change every night the concert because it's exactly the reason why this music was wrote was wrote for to be improvised and make every moment new thing and this is also for the voice uh, today it's difficult uh, instrument voice you can imagine for example then the singers and the music and the performance improvise every time new solution you have a aria or you have a concerto and you do new thing every concert it's it's uh, it's pretty impossible today. The singers try to wrote ornamentation, good make, and they try to repeat every time the same because it's, it's of course difficult. Uh, but what is uh, historical correct, political correct, it's changed for every concert, your ornamentation. This is what the reason why the people consider one singer better than the another. And at the same time, a violinist better of another because it was able to change every concert with new ornamentation and new think, new fantasy think in 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 the music. So it's uh, it's complicated. But of course, if you don't enjoy, if you don't try to do a love act, love in the music, uh, I think this repertoire is not sense. It excludes Bach, excludes some big maestro in the 18th century. The rest of the music risks to be not very interesting, but it's very, very, very difficult. And what I hope is that critics understand at which point a violinist or a singer take risk, because when we take risk, but we are winner, we do something that nobody is able to do. So it's a very big difference. It's not, uh, 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 you know, when, when, I, when I listen to a violinist or a singer, I understand immediately if the process is mechanical or, uh, you can say, uh, um, process uh, um, emotional. Uh, and and emotional, it's a thousand uh, better, but it's a thousand difficult than the mechanical. So it's, uh, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a big thing. Well, you you mentioned uh, one thing that uh, I think shines in a very very specific way, and uh, it's an explanation in itself. You say. To dominate now in uh, sexual psychology, there is a term uh, la dominatrix, mm. the woman that, uh, and that's exactly the difference between, I think, the way you talk about dominating a piece of music, because once you have this control, you are able to let yourself go. I mean, to show love. It's not something easy to because uh, people normally feel naked. But they show love. They feel naked. They feel vulnerable. And I think it must be about the same uh, when you feel that you want to show love to a piece of music, and then you are carried away, and the love makes you do something funny. So you have to have the security and the confidence uh, in the I would call it the combination of il tuo spirito, your soul, and the music, which is very nice. I'm going to surprise you now, uh, Fabio, as I said before, 
And uh, I would like us to listen to something that uh, I found in Tel Aviv a couple of uh, weeks ago. Just a second. Here we go. I don't know if you will know it or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cornelia. Fabio. <ride> Siamo rimasti soli, guys. Ma, ma come, cosa succede? Perché io non Dan, riesco a... Dan, Dan disappear. Dove? No, he, he's there, I just said Dan. <ride> Dan. <ride> it, was, it was really a surprise. Uh, no, I can't sit there because uh -huh. I have the music on my phone. Oh. Uh, just, I gave you the uh, presentership. I'm going to leave. Just tell him, please. I'm going to leave the uh, meeting and okay. come back. Yeah. Oh, okay, so he's going to get in, get, get out and get in. So maybe this week we'll do the trick. Dai Fabio, raccontati qualcosa. <laughs> Hello guys. Hello everybody. I'm so happy because there is a lot of girls in my meeting. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very lucky man. <laughs> no, that's great. Sorry for my long blah, blah, blah. Because uh, we start with some tema like uh, violin, mito, and passion, and then we talk about singers. Every time I see Anne and I start to sing about about singers, so of course, and our project and a lot of things. Uh, and also apologize for my little English, I'm sorry. 
voglio parlare italiano o spanish o uh, french but well it's not every time uh, easy ciao barbara che non sento la tua voce non ci sei il tuo microfono non funziona ma il fatto che ti vedo già è molto bello, basta questo. And then, uh, well, I, I would like to organize a, a, a airplane for everybody for comes in some production. Um, the next, it's probably not, uh, I mean, we meet Anne for Ariosti with uh, stage performance in Siena. But the music is beautiful, so in, I invite everybody to um, listen this music from the Orf Austria Radio because it's it's really the music, it's uh, unbelievable beauty and very good singer. And then uh, August is a very important month because we have our recording with Anna uh, dedicated to the Italian Marcolini project done, come back, I think. Eccoci we, are qua. Very, we are very happy about this. Uh, I guess I missed a lot, but... Uh, we, we can't see you. No, no, I know you can't no. see me. Just a second. Here we are. I'm, I'm sorry about this, but it's very strange. Uh, Nira and I have the same connection. And... Uh, What I found out is that it does not work on my computer and it works on your computer, the Mira. Don't ask me why. I think what happens here is all the fault of Cornelia, because Cornelia said that she has no internet connection. And then all of a sudden I found her. So what happened is the, there is a little angel of the internet, and the angel of the internet grants his favor to one person per evening. So Cornelia took the favor over and I was disconnected. Don't listen to me. Just a lot of, uh, uh, let me see if I can, ah, uh, give me back my uh, presentership because otherwise I can't do anything. Mira, will you please? I see that Cornelia is the uh, presenter. Cornelia was the presenter. Oh, yeah, but how, how do I give you the presentership? I no, 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 I took it. I took it. Oh, you don't okay. give me. I can't. <laughs> be, my, be my guest. <laughs> you will never give me anything, anyhow. So, Fabio, uh, as I said before, if you remember, I said that I was going to surprise you with a piece uh, of music that I found that you recorded in 1995 for Opus 111. And uh, I will say nothing about it. First of all, we'll listen to it. And uh, then I would be very glad if you would tell us a little bit about it. Here we are. I hope this time is going to work. And uh, let me get myself here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so please, everybody, mute your microphones. And uh, we are going to listen to something, a surprise. Fabio, ci sei? Sì, sì, ci sono, certo. Ah, ecco di qua. Allora, la sorpresa.
difficulty, you remember, Fabio? Che bella sorpresa, eh? <ride> un bellissimo ricordo di questo disco, Mike Schubert. È la sonata 500, sì, mi sembra 47, no? Of sì, course, sì, yeah, but uh, was very, I mean, um, I am very happy about this record. The only thing it's uh, too much years ago. <laughs> yeah, I was not uh, not very prepared about the romantic music with original instruments. I mean, this is uh, was was at this time was the first recording with uh, pianoforte and original violin of Schubert. Uh, the people was very happy. The critics was good, but the people say, "Oh, please, we want more Vivaldi." And, uh, <laughs> that's that's typical. Well, I must say something. I must say, I uh, think Olga played the uh, forte piano, not yes, the piano forte, yes, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but I, what I found uh, really surprising in this piece, uh, I, I'm a big lover of Schubert. And uh, Schubert has a kind of a very intimate way of uh, touching me in places that I didn't even know I had, uh, but the way that this performance is executed brings something new to Schubert, mm -hmm. which I never heard before. You bring mystery. You bring mystery. You bring a, a way of looking at things with wonderment, with astonishment. And uh, uh, Schubert, to me, fully. I call it Moody Canicto because it sets music. There's, uh, he doesn't care about anything else, and everything that he did was very, very beautiful. But if you put in your famous art of Pablo, yes? Um, I'm not telling you, you know, I, I used to think, and I still do, that you are a reincarnation of Antonio Vivaldi without the red priest and everything else. But, uh, uh, but the way that Vivaldi is playing Schubert is quite amazing. And the fact that uh, Vivaldi lived uh, 100 years before Schubert, uh, the way you play this is not Baroque, but it's not Schubert. It's Fabio Biondi. And uh, it's this sense of mystery that I'm, I'm trying to understand where it comes from. And, I, uh, and of course, there's a fantastic feeling between in the dialogue between uh, the uh, forte piano and uh, and the violin, uh, which again happens a lot of times because you know uh, we had who didn't play the sonata for violin and uh, piano, uh, but again it did not have this feeling of mystery, this feeling of uh, a continuous surprise. Uh, another thing, it gives me almost the sensation, which is stupid, I don't know why, but the more I listen to it, the more it becomes an ode to Beethoven, an ode to perfection. Uh, and so I thought that make this surprise to you. And uh, so you have two surprises. You have a new niece with him, Carol. And uh, I really, I, this is a fantastic piece. Uh, if you want it, I'll send you all. <laughs> I'm sure you have it. But, uh, no, thank you. It, it was... it, it's a very nice surprise. What I want to say is it's maybe the last thing because it's, uh, it uh, was a very long night and great. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, it's uh, in one way, you know. Uh, well, thank you for your word, and 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 I, I I am happy too about this Schubert. But I think the key, in one way, is of course that's me. I recognize me and my fine my 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 style. But what what is very important in every repertoire is to have the possibility to look back and to look after. And Schubert, it's it's very important because some ancestral uh, pattern in Schubert are very, very, very important. 
put Schubert in a romantic way, sometimes it's a big mistake. If you don't recognize in this music Haydn and Schubert and uh, Mozart, it's really a pity. And I think in this uh, record, what's happened is that you have also the young Schubert, you have the child part of him. And that's also very important in terms of sound. Olga share with me this feeling because she's very uh, Mozartiana and she, she, she know perfectly Haydn and Mozart. And I think uh, her approach to the pianoforte in Schubert is perfect also for this reason. So in this, uh, in this sonata, you recognize something uh, which is from which part of the music Schubert comes. And then probably it's also interesting for understand what is the future of Schubert. So I think the real moral of uh, uh, Ascolto of this record for me is uh, we need to know a lot of things about the composer before and after. It's a good way for Anderson really a period, a musical period. Otherwise, it's, it's impossible to really to, to understand the context of the music that we, we play and perform. Yeah, well, again, you said it, and I would like to uh, <laughs> underline it if it's necessary. The first thing that I heard which was surprising is l'attacco, the, the way that you approach uh, the music, which is Fabio, 100%. But then it's 100% Schubert. You, know, mm -hmm. you didn't go against, uh, you tried to take Schubert with you, and it became more Fabio and more Schubert. Nobody, it's a win win situation, as the Americans say. Nobody was losing here. And, uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, I would like to ask everybody if it's okay that we have breakfast together. Uh, I'm preparing some poisson and uh, tornetti. Uh, if anybody wants uh, crepe, Suzette, or something like that, everything is being prepared in the other room. But in the meantime, I would like to touch upon the real Il Furioso, the real fury of the violin, uh, which in my book is Corelli, you know, the, uh, the flames, the fire that comes out. So uh, I chose the uh, Sonata da Camera, the Chacona, and uh, Okay, if we listen to it first, and then you tell us a little bit about it. Uh, that's that's great. But let me check. In five minutes, I have my babysitter that ah. stop her work for me. Okay. <laughs> so I must be okay. checking at least if my daughter sleep or not. Uh, otherwise, of course, I enjoy. So um, I will try. Okay. Okay. Well, just in case that you are leaving us in the middle, uh, thank you again, Fabio. It was again a terrible uh, sensation, experience, whatever uh, we can call it. And uh, the meetings with you in Utopia are not meetings in the plural. They are one long meeting with uh, some, you know, sometimes you have to go to Greece, sometimes you have to go and see if your daughter is asleep, and sometimes you are in La Coruña, but it's one meeting. I, I have the feeling that uh, Sophia is so much in your debt. Uh, yeah, yeah. Del tuo uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoy a lot, and, and it's really a big pleasure, especially because, but I think it's for every musician and every people that you invite in Youth Sofia, it's the same thing. We, thanks to you, we destroyed the vacuita of the modern society. We need contact, we need uh, uh, try to reproduce the academia like it was in the 18th and 19th century where the people sit together and talk about culture and music. 
because we are in a very difficult moment in terms of psychological and and uh, um, ancestral and uh, also uh, human uh, feeling today and we need meet people intelligent and sensible so it's uh, for me it's real a pleasure you know uh, one of our guests uh, with a philosopher Professor Agassi said something that uh, made things very clear. The human society lost the possibility to communicate in sync. You know, you communicate through Facebook, you write something, somebody else writes it later, there's no synchronization. It doesn't happen together. When there's a synchronization, it's only one part is passive, like a listener in the radio or in the concert, and the other part is giving. And uh, he told me that he feels that in Eusophia we have a synchronized uh, collaboration uh, because things happen at one time, but uh, they happen in a proactive way. So let's listen to Corelli, and if the daughter allows us to finish it, it's a very short piece. It's only less than three minutes. And uh, I will say good night to you now if you have to leave in the middle. And if not, we'll say good night later. Please mute your microphones, everybody, and let's listen to Sonata da Camera di Corelli in uh, G major. Here we go. Okay, that was friendly. Uh, next time, I hope to hear Fabio uh, with Corelli and Donatelli. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I want. I need to tell you something from Carol. She would like to say good night to you, Uncle Fabio. And, Ciao, Carol. Uh, good night. Carol, she's not there. Yes, she is. Sorry. There we go. Um, Good night, Uncle Fabio. Good night, Carol. Thank you. I'll stay with us. Okay. To everybody, bravi and grazie. To everybody and thank you to Dan. Thank you so much, Fabio. My family. That's. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. The most important part of our life. Yeah. Uh, ti posso chiamare martedì per il discorso? Certo. Volentieri. Okay. Sì. Buona Ciao. serata, grazie. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for joining us here at Sofia for Minds Meet online, and we had some very beautiful minds tonight. Thank you.